the story of Tucker Carlson and the woke right. Many people in the West have been surprised by the events of the last week, in which American TV presenter Tucker Carlson followed his interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin with a series of increasingly bizarre videos. Tucker discovers that Moscow metro stations are grand and impressive, that Russian supermarkets have shopping carts that can be rented with a coin that you can retrieve on returning the cart, and that food is cheaper in Russia. I know you don't have a lot of time, so I won't bore you by debunking the silliness here. If you're interested in what I think of it, go to the end of this video and there'll be an explanation. Instead, let me explain why I am not surprised at what we've seen from Tucker. I appeared on Tucker's show twice during his tenure at Fox News. On both occasions, we discussed subjects on which we agree, the erosion of freedom of speech in the West and the dangers the woke left poses to our society. My second appearance took place in January 2023, as the debate over the war in Ukraine raged all over Western media. In the months prior, Tucker ran segment after segment on the supposed persecution of Christians in Ukraine, which were full of fabrications and lies. Not only were they dishonest, they demonstrated an inexplicable ignorance of the facts for someone with his audience and prominence in American journalism. I went into my second segment with Tucker, intent on challenging him if the opportunity presented itself, but the brief appearance focused on my Oxford speech and ended before I'd had the chance to raise my objections to his coverage of the war in Ukraine. His producer WhatsApped me immediately after to congratulate me on the appearance with the invitation to please come back soon. Here's my moment, I naively thought to myself, and replied with the offer to come back and discuss my disagreements with Tucker about the war in Ukraine. The response was telling. I'm just not sure it would be great TV to have him debate you on the war. Why? Because it would get heated. What if we just had a rational debate about it? And besides, if it did get heated, that would get a lot of views. There are many angles to this. For example, how Biden is using the war. The Hunter-Ukraine nexus came the reply. After a long back and forth, the producer finally revealed that he didn't want to ruin things for me. After all, if the debate got heated and nasty, it would be a risk in terms of my appearing on the show ever again, he explained. The message was clear. We don't want to have a discussion about this, and if you keep pressing, you won't be coming back on the biggest show in America. There's nothing wrong with any of this, by the way. No one is entitled to appear on anyone else's show to talk about a subject they nominate. Tucker and his producers are perfectly entitled to invite the guests they want to discuss the subjects they want. But the incident made it obvious to me that Tucker was not a truth-seeking journalist and that when it came to Russia and the war in Ukraine at least, he had no intention of being objective. That much is obvious, especially after the events of the last week. But the real question is why? Why is the dissident right going woke? In Russia, we have a saying, everything new is something old that's been sufficiently forgotten. Far from being the first of his kind, Tucker is, in fact, one more name to add to the long list of Westerners who have been seduced by the allure of an alternative to the failures and decadence of their own societies. These people are often described as useful idiots. While they are certainly useful, as with Tucker, they are often intelligent, principled and courageous. Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw visited Moscow in 1931, where, like Tucker, he was granted a two-hour audience with Joseph Stalin, which he summed up with the words, I expected to see a Russian worker and I found a Georgian gentleman. One of Shaw's main contributions to the culture of his day was to advocate for and defend one's duty to be a skeptic. As Fintan O'Toole wrote brilliantly in an article you can find in the description of this video, George Bernard Shaw challenged his readers and audiences to burst bubbles of conventional wisdom on almost every issue imaginable. When Shaw's demolitions of received ideas provoked outrage, he courageously defended his intellectual independence. He abhorred cruelty and made mincemeat of propaganda. How could a man so principled, courageous and eternally questioning end up siding with the most murderous dictator of his era? We have to remember, O'Toole writes, the power of wish fulfillment and the way that Russia became for many Westerners not a place, but an idea, not a mere reality, but a fantasy. Shaw's insistence on seeing the Soviet Union as the harbinger of the great socialist utopia can be explained by the disappointments of democracy. Especially as the Great Depression took hold, parliaments and political parties seemed utterly ineffectual. Stalin's apparent ability to move mountains and transform society with triumphant five-year plans offered an antidote to his impatience with the frustrations of democracy. The parallels here hardly need elaborating. Replace Stalin with Putin and Shaw with Carlson in the passages I just read, and you need hardly change anything. 
While the woke left hates America and the West because it sees them as the root of all evil, the woke right has built a powerful resentment of its own. Where the woke left has systemic racism, the woke right has globalism and the WEF, a shadowy global elite conspiring to deprive us of our civil rights, civil liberties and bodily autonomy. Stagnating wages, uncontrolled and increasingly illegal mass immigration, the housing crisis, the deliberate stoking of racial tensions, blatant anti-white, anti-male, anti-family rhetoric, the promotion of trans ideology, and a whole host of other issues have turned many people from skeptics into cynics. These frustrations, many of which are legitimate, are further exacerbated by the biggest problem of all. Despite being shared by a majority of the population, attempts to address these concerns via the democratic process appear increasingly futile. The UK elected a supposedly conservative government in 2010 and then voted for Brexit in 2016 in order to deal with many of these issues. The result was years of political gridlock, followed by all of these problems getting worse, not better. In the US, the 2016 election of Donald Trump was another desperate move to deal with these concerns. We don't care about his obnoxious tweets, his voters cried. We need someone with the balls to put an end to politics as usual, stem the flow of illegal crossings at the border, and halt the cultural rot eating away at America's soul. But instead of waking from this stupor, America's media and political elites did everything in their power to stop Trump from delivering on the promises he had made to his voters. They lied about him endlessly. They thwarted him at every turn. In the end, they impeached him and are now prosecuting him. And, to add insult to injury, they replaced him with a man who struggles to get through a press conference, leaving many people on the right with the obvious question. If we can't vote our way out of this nightmare, what good is democracy? If democracy means decriminalizing crime, rampant homelessness, weakness abroad and chaos at home, isn't it time to look at the alternatives, they say. The right's fascination with Vladimir Putin and Salvadorian President Nayib Bukele is not accidental. While in America and Britain we sit and helplessly watch escalating levels of street violence, crime and squalor, Bukele has turned El Salvador from the most dangerous country in Latin America to the safest in the Western Hemisphere in a matter of years. How? He locked up gang members en masse, ignoring the protestations of foreign human rights organizations and domestic critics. Despite his increasingly muscular methods, he enjoys astonishing support, which recently secured him another presidential term following a stunning electoral victory. Democracy is supposed to mean government by consent. But who enjoys more consent? Joe Biden, 38% approval rating, Rishi Sunak, 24% approval rating, or Nayib Bukele, 85% approval rating. And even more importantly, whose country is safer, cleaner, and clearer about its direction for the future? Tomorrow, I leave this land of hope and return to our Western countries, the countries of despair, Shaw said on leaving the USSR in 1931. Last week, Tucker might as well have said the same thing. Like Trump before him, Tucker Carlson is not the problem. He is a symptom. And unless Western elites start listening to the people they're supposed to represent, the problem is only going to get worse. And so are the symptoms. The smart politicians know it. The question is, will they do anything about it? As promised, let's address the videos Tucker made from the Russian supermarket and the Russian metro. The average household income in Russia is less than $15,000, compared to $75,000 in America. As a result, the average Russian household spends more than a third of its income on food, compared to just 11% for the average American family. In other words, food is three times more expensive for the average Russian than for the average American. Moscow metro stations are indeed magnificent, but to compare them favorably with those in the West is akin to suggesting that Iraq under Saddam Hussein was better than America because Saddam's presidential palace was far more impressive than the White House. Authoritarian societies like the Soviet Union, which built the Moscow metro, often pour great energy into grandiose monuments. It's truly impressive what you can do with a bunch of slave labor and no human rights. Let me not mock Tucker's response to Russia's spectacular achievements in the trolley return technology department. I distinctly remember my own wondrous reaction when first encountering this stunning coin-operated mechanism. It was a truly memorable moment, primarily because I first encountered it in 1995 here in the West, having come from Russia where shops did not have this trolley return mechanism. Mainly because shops in Russia at that time didn't even have shopping trolleys. Just before recording this video, I popped down to my local supermarket to make sure I hadn't missed anything, and I'm happy to confirm this magnificent contraption remains in place at the Tesco Express down the road from me. 
Perhaps Tucker might wish to consider immigrating to rural Kent in search of a better life.